Hi everyone, my name is Laura and this is Eric Life's Expert Talks. Uh, everyone in this life will experience unexpected challenges and sudden changes. And these changes affect people. It brings strong emotions, difficult thoughts and of course uncertainty. Yet people generally adapt well over time to changing situations and the stress that it brings. And that is in part thanks to resilience. Because becoming more resilient not only helps you overcome tricky circumstances, it also empowers you to grow and improve along the way. And it applies to our work life too, and aviation industry is no exception. But before I get ahead of myself, let me introduce you to one of the R class instructors who can tell us much more about this matter, and that is John Flett. So John, thanks for joining me today. No problem, Lara. Thank you very much for inviting me. Wonderful. So what we're going to do today is we're going to discuss this whole idea of resilience, what it is. Uh, but of course, we'll also use this time to get to know you better as a lecturer, as a person. And I'm going to start with the same question that I ask everyone that comes here. But I think it's one of the most important questions. How did your career in aviation start? Uh, so I, I was uh, reflecting on this, uh, as I do quite often, because it's been uh, over 30 year association with aviation now. And um, it was actually quite a, a little bit of a selfish uh, um, thought about how I got involved with aviation is that I was on vacation in Los Angeles uh, with a friend and we were there for a couple of weeks. And over the course of those weeks, uh, one of his colleagues who worked for um, an airline was staying at that hotel with the crew. and. Um, joined us for some of the activities we were doing uh, while we were on holiday. Not just uh, for a couple of days one week, but uh, he was back the next uh, week for another couple of days. And, and I thought, wow, he's at work and this is what he's getting to do. And uh, this uh, seems uh, pretty great. And at the time um, I was involved, uh, my background is in cinema and theatres and theatre management. And it was going through a bit of a, a, bit of a change. Uh, because of the introduction of video, sorry, I'm dating myself now, uh, home video. And so I was sort of thinking about what would be next. And uh, so having this experience, I thought, you know what, aviation uh, looks like it's a great, uh, a great business to be in. So that was sort of my initial introduction to it. And um, here we are, you know, over 30 years later and uh, still love it. Right. So uh, I'm glad to hear that. Obviously, everyone that uh, comes to Expert Talks, they always also always say that they love it still and that's I mean what fascinates me because once you get into aviation I feel like you never really come out of it or at least it stays a little bit with you but now that you look back to your experience and as you said it's 30 years is there anything that really stands out for you like whenever someone asks you to tell a, a story about the most important or most you know significant assignment that you ever had Yes, well, I think, you know, and, and you mentioned there, Lara, about the fact that people who get involved, it, it really gets into their blood. And, and we sort of joke that if you, you know, you bleed aviation gas or ab gas, you know, it, it really is intoxicating, uh, not the actual smelling of it, but uh, actually being involved in the industry. Uh, it's really intoxicating and, and you know, because it's so changeable um, and, and it's so different and so vibrant. And with my background, which was very much customer facing, of course, every every day is different because you're dealing with different people, not only your, your passengers, your customers, um, but you're also with your colleagues. You're working with a different group of people every day in, in the cabin crew arena that I started out at in, in aviation. And so, you know, it's, it's just this vibrant industry. And so when you ask, you know, if I can reflect on one sort of uh, element, there's just so many experiences that I've had. Um, but I think the one that um, I think has more, most meaning for me in my career with, with the airline was um, uh, being involved in the introduction of new aircraft. And um, with this particular project, I was sort of brought in um, to assist one of my colleagues, uh, I was ground management by that time, um, to assist one of my colleagues um, who was involved in the project. And she sort of said, here, I don't have time for this. Um, could you look after the uh, in-flight video, uh, introduction of the in-flight video for the new aircraft? 
Uh, so the uh, involvement in the project with the introduction of a new aircraft, uh, it sort of brought together my background in, in cinema and TV, as well as um, being on board the aircraft and dealing directly with the customers and, and the customers using the in-flight engine, the design of how the crew would interact with the um, in-flight entertainment. And and then, of course, um, dealing with you know people from across different parts of the business, uh, outside of the business, uh, and to then see that aircraft arrive with, with everything in it and know actually just how many people had collaborated uh, on making uh, this event happen and the introduction of this aircraft happen. And, and that's, again, you know, going back to what I love about the industry and why the industry, you know, sort of stimulates you and, and excites you constantly is that you realize you know you're, you're working with people from all different backgrounds um, the people who are in marketing finance cargo engineering uh, of course your colleagues who work in the same area as you uh, the check-in people at the airports the external people you know i mean yeah i could go on and on but i'll uh, <laughs> i'll uh, i'll uh, rope it back in but yeah that was uh, that was one of the um that was probably the most uh, memorable and, and a couple of other things which I, I, I'm sure uh, we'll get into as well. But you started your career as cabin crew member, right? Uh, my airline career, yes. I, I yeah. started as cabin crew. Um, I think with the industry, um, that getting in on a frontline uh, role is usually the, the way that people get into the industry. Um, you know, um, at, especially initial introduction uh, to the industry is usually in, in a frontline uh, customer service uh, kind of role seems to be a lot of opportunity there and um, and of course uh, you know as airlines were sort of expanding and bringing new aircraft in of course you need more and more and more so I, I sort of came in uh, at a time when the industry was uh, or the airline was bringing in new types of aircraft so of course they needed to um, needed to expand uh, their workforce. So have you ever counted how many times you've been in the air? I mean, because for me, cabin crew members are so fascinating because I don't like flying. I'm going to say that straight up. I don't like it. And I cannot understand how can someone do this as a job. But like, have you ever counted the number? How many times yeah. you've been in the air? I haven't, but I'm sort of curious what is it about flying that you don't like? Uh, what What's uh, not to like? Oh, that's another discussion. I think it's one of those, <laughs> uh, you know, fear things and just maybe I need more resilience, but we'll get on that later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, so you started as a cabin crew member and now you're actually an, in an instructor at Ara class. Um, so, I mean, there are two points very different. So how <laughs> did we get to from point A to point B? Oh, well, I'll look, I'll, I'll keep it uh, quite brief, um, but I think it's, it's uh, one of those things where um, you identify opportunities and, and things happen uh, within, your, within your career. And actually, this is sort of bringing in the resilience and, and the ability to sort of manage change. Uh, when you sort of look at these things that happen, you, you can either see them as an opportunity or, or a barrier or a challenge. And for me, um, it was at a certain stage in my life, I saw some different opportunities and places that I uh, wanted to sort of go to or be, uh, both within my personal and professional life. So uh, with Cabin Crew, it was about, okay, my personal situation changed. So, okay, how can I stay within the industry and not, um, uh, not be away uh, from my family? And so I sort of went on the ground and was involved in uh, ground management uh, uh, for several years, which is when I got involved in uh, special projects, uh, which was excellent. I had an opportunity, I took an opportunity to uh, work in another part of the world. And so I worked in, in Europe for a while and the UK. And, um, and then uh, there was a few changes happened within the business. And at the same time, I'd, I'd uh, actually just achieved my master's uh, degree in airline and airport management. And um, I transitioned into academia. So I was working as a um, course leader and senior lecturer in aviation management and aviation operations. Uh, so I did that for several uh, years and attained a um, postgraduate certificate in academic practice. 
Uh, so, you know, again, just sort of developing the, uh, the training uh, element. And um, yes, so that, that sort of um, led me into becoming involved with uh, delivering uh, training to aviation professionals around the world um, alongside my academic uh, background and academic career. And now you also moved into e-learning as well, because that's relatively new. And I want to ask you something about that. Um, as, a, as an instructor and as a student in the past yourself, do you think that e-learning is taking something away from students? No, I, I don't think it's taking something away. I think it's, um, it's one of those uh, things that people sort of say, oh, well, you know, it's not the same as face-to-face. -face. And, and of course, with um, the uh, proliferation of virtual um, training through necessity and what we're doing now, obviously, as well, um, you know, it's, it's different. And I think that's where the approach has to be. Um, of course, there's certain times when face-to-face -face or traditional learning, classroom learning, um, is appropriate and uh, required, um, but actually when you're looking at uh, e-learning and then creating standalone um, modules or you're looking at virtual delivery um, or you're looking at um, you know what the aero class uh, courses are, which is self-contained uh, elements and courses that people consume at their own pace, um, it's about ensuring that whatever the delivery is, is actually fit for purpose. So uh, I, I don't see it as taking away. I actually see it as, uh, again, it's uh, that whole reframing thing of resilience. It's about reframing it and seeing it as opportunity uh, to actually get your learning objectives and, and the business objectives um, through in another medium. Um, but it has to be actually be fit for purpose. And so, um, you know, it's, it's can't just say everything has to be face to face, uh, everything shipped to virtual, uh, everything's e-learning and standalone. Um, you actually have to see what is, is going to serve the purpose best for the learners, because at the end of the day, it's actually all about um, the learners uh, achieving the objectives and, and those objectives course will be linked uh, to their business objectives, if it's uh, through corporate training, or their personal objectives, if it's about self-development. And, and of course, people learn in different ways also, so uh, have different learning styles. And so therefore, having that range of ways in which to learn, I think it can only enhance um, the uh, knowledge uh, distribution and the, um, uh, the knowledge um, management uh, going forward. So that's, um, you know, and as, an, as a participant, someone who has actually undertaken uh, e-learning and it's something that uh, the airline I was involved with it, has done for um, a number of years, uh, probably uh, 20, nearly 20 years, if not um, uh, a little bit more when, um, you know, the internet sort of first started um, a little bit after that, um, sort of introduced that e-learning. So, yeah, I, I don't see it doesn't take away at all. I think it's it's about ensuring that whatever medium we use is fit for purpose to meet um, the objectives of the learner and the objectives of the um, of the corporation or the business. So speaking about learners, um, I want to give you the floor to introduce your own course that you have at Eric to our viewers. Just tell us what it is about, uh, who would really you know enjoy it, and anything else you want to add. Yes, so thanks, Laura. So the, the course is Resilience in the Workplace, uh, Concepts for Aviation Professionals. And the objective around it is, is because actually resilience and some of the elements of resilience are, are quite big uh, topics that you could, uh, you know, you could spend quite a lot of time on, on, on each of the, uh, of the topics that within it. So, so the purpose of the course is to um, present uh, concepts of resilience uh, that perhaps uh, aviation professionals, so those who are already uh, within the industry, uh, could sort of look at and go, oh, okay, maybe that's something um, we need to look into a little bit more uh, for the business, you know, so how are we um, measuring resilience uh, with our candidates that are coming in uh, to the business, uh, but also for those who are perhaps looking to get into aviation, um, just being aware of how they can build their own resilience and also how they can demonstrate uh, the resilience that they already have if they're seeking to come into the industry. Because, you know, with the, the industry has always um, 
changed. It's, it's, it's always been susceptible to lots of external factors. Um, and uh, of course, um, you know, the most significant one has been over the last uh, 18 to 20 months with the, with the pandemic, um, where the industry, of course, has been the worst, um, the worst um, uh, impact that's ever had on, on aviation. But prior to that, there were multiple other uh, impacts where people had to show resilience and get through certain situations, uh, whether that was 9-11 or whether it was the global financial crisis, um, different events in their regions that may have impacted the industry, um, whether the industry itself or the company that you work for had gone through tough times and, and needed to retrench or whatever it is. So it's sort of always something that um, uh, has been part of the industry. And I think it's just, again, making people aware that going forward now, uh, there will be obviously a lot more focus on having resilient uh, people within the business because you know we'll continue to see um, repercussions from what we're going through now um, but also we will still have um, all of those other things uh, happening to the industry that used to happen uh, beforehand and things like bringing in new aircraft into the into the business how does that affect your job within the industry um, what opportunities does it present what challenges does it present um, your business that you work for, your airline you work for, um, may be taken over by another uh, another airline um, with the consolidation and concentration of the industry. So how will that affect you? So it's, it's sort of, uh, it's just bringing those concepts or, or touching on those concepts and, uh, to people who, who see the course and hopefully it will stimulate them to um, look into the subject and look into how they themselves, um, either from a corporate perspective or an individual perspective, um, are actually uh, managing and dealing with resilience. So it's a, it's a very compact, uh, uh, compact course on resilience. So, of course, for everyone who wants to know more, uh, I invite uh, them to visit our website, find John's course, and of course, finish it. I've done it myself. And that's why I want to get a bit more uh, about resilience from you, because um, once I watched the, co the course, uh, I could identify the places where I could be more resilient towards my work, even in my everyday life. But we're also talking about corporate resilience, as you mentioned, that uh, it, the same goes for organizations. Uh, but it seems that organizations do not have that learning culture at the moment, at least some of them. Some of them might have like this amazing, you know, program and some of them are still a bit wary of this. So how do you think, how important is this learning culture in organizations for them to succeed, of course? Well, I think it's extremely, uh, extremely important and um, research that has, has been done and, and produced by uh, the industry body IATA has identified that actually people coming into the industry are looking for those learning and development opportunities continuously through their careers. And I, and I think, you know, with the, the whole concept of learning culture, it, it has to be embedded within uh, the actual organization as something that is a day-to-day -day, uh, occurrence, not just, oh, okay, uh, we've got a problem, uh, let's have some training and let's send people to that training, tick, uh, we've done that, so we've dealt with that. Uh, that that kind of thinking is uh, is uh, passe now. Um, it, uh, I don't think it ever should have been uh, how people thought about things. Um, but more, more than ever, um, learning culture actually has to be embedded into the day-to-day -day operation. And whether that is through having um, you know, supervisors or, or people in leadership roles, influential roles within the business. I'm hesitating using the word manager because uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of that word manager. Um, so, you know, people who are, are in leadership roles or influential within the business, whether that is that they have the skills to perhaps deliver um, meaningful feedback to people. So therefore, you know, people actually learning uh, from having a colleague or having, as I say, someone in a leadership role or, or supervisory role, um, sort of encouraging them, highlighting what they've done well, maybe some of the areas of, of improvement. That's all part of a learning culture. 
um, it, it doesn't just sort of sit with, oh, okay, I went to that training course and, and this is what I learned. Um, it's actually about how you apply that in the day to day, um, how you're able to actually measure that as achieving the goals um, that were initially set uh, for the business and what the business objectives are. So it's, uh, you know, I think it's something that uh, hopefully, um, and I know there have been several, uh, several businesses, quite a few businesses within the aviation industry who have identified that this uh, particular period over the last uh, 18 to 20 months has been one whereby uh, they can actually invest in their people rather than um, oh, okay, we need to save money, so let's cut out all of the training. Um, that doesn't uh, signify a learning culture. So having that uh, ethos or that thinking that, that learning happens all the time um, or you know, with, within your day-to-day day -day, um, uh, business operation is one that I think uh, needs to needs to be embraced, and that's that's not just from the business perspective. That's also um, you know from the individual's perspective as well. Um, that they also you know they're coming to work. Um, yes, a lot of the a lot of the roles that um, people carry out uh, are quite rote, and uh, they're doing the same tasks again and again and again. Um, but you know how can they actually look at ways for um, you know, making improvement to that. Um, are the actual processes and systems in place within the organization that people can, um, you know, show that they understand how uh, this particular process or system can be improved for the benefit of the business, and for the benefit of um, individuals and for the benefit of the, um, the customers and passengers as well. So, yeah, it's quite a, quite a big uh, sort of um, uh, uh, topic, but, um, you know, there's been there's a lot of positive um, positive stories out there where that has been um, is being embraced, and, and and it needs to because you know as we've seen over the last 18 to 20 months, you know we rely on people within the industry to make make it happen. I mentioned earlier about the collaborative um, you know element of a project of bringing people across um, within the business and outside of the business together to create this amazing. Uh, amazing aircraft to bring this aircraft into service. Um, we've seen over the last 18 to 20 months, all the different changes, and the restrictions and the changes of restrictions that people have had to deal with and communicate uh, within the confines and the restrictions of, of, uh, of a pandemic. And, and I've just experienced it firsthand by traveling internationally uh, in the last couple of weeks. And I just, I'm in awe of, of the frontline workers um, and the aviation workers that are um, delivering that and how, they, how they're coping with, uh, with everything. And of course, that's going to be required and seen as a necessity um, going forward. So, um, you know, that's why people, I think, need to, be, need to be aware of how they can illustrate their resilience and how they can develop, uh, develop their resilience as well. So, of course, as you mentioned, the last months and year and a half, and it seems that it's still going on, the COVID pandemic has influenced businesses all over the world and especially aviation. But do you think it made a bigger impact on that kind of resilience? Because resilience and learning in itself, it's quite parallel, isn't it? So resilience is just learning how to be, you know, kind of safe in the uncertainty. So do you think this COVID pandemic increased this kind of need for it, or at least it brought attention to it more? Absolutely, absolutely, and 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 I think that's where you know if we look at um, and, and I sort of have contacts in different uh, different aviation businesses, um, it's sort of been highlighted there, you know, that that level of resilience. What's been asked uh, from the people within the industry over the last eight to twenty months has just been incredible, and and um, you know it's sort of not sustainable uh, going forward unless you able to have some kind of tools on how to how to deal with it and how to manage it. And because it's not just been within their work lives, of course, it's been within all of our um, personal lives as well. And and so therefore, as, as you sort of mentioned earlier, Lara, you know, um, looking at the course, sort of thinking about it from your from your personal life and what you can, you know, how you reframe things that happen to you. Um, because, you know, we. We like to think we're in control, uh, but we're not in control. There's so many different external factors that impact us uh, individually uh, or personally, uh, as well as obviously in the in the workplace as well. That we have to be able to uh, navigate that and manage it 
uh, to continue functioning. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's something that uh, uh, I know quite a lot of people have struggled with and, and uh, there's, you know, lots of support or so there needs to be support out there for people. But again, it's one of those things whereby, yes, we can, you know, provide the provide the crutch or, or the ambulance at the end of the cliff, uh, at the bottom of the cliff kind of thing, or we can actually talk about resilience, we can bring resilience into uh, the workplace and, and you know, work alongside with wellness and, uh, you know, well-being and, and so on uh, to actually assist and support um, uh, support ourselves and support our people. So it's, uh, you know, it is, it's right alongside learning, you know, it's, it's, it's learning how to deal with change, um, manage uncertainty um, and to reframe uh, what's happening uh, to us and um, look to actually navigate our way, uh, our way through it. So, um, you know, it's not something we should be doing alone. Uh, we should be drawing in, on the resources that are available and the support that's available to us. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a big, big thing. <laughs> yes, all the sources available at our class website. Just listen to John's course. <laughs> So lastly, um, I want to talk about uh, something that you mentioned in the course. Um, and there you talk about the domains of resilience and you mentioned a few of them. I'm not gonna, you know, spoil them for everyone. Uh, but I do want to mention the one that you said was the most important one and that is vision. So can you tell us why it's the most important one? Sure, sure. Well, they, those um, domains of resilience, Lara, that's uh, from a, uh, an app uh, called Driven. And uh, I mean, there's different, um, obviously uh, putting my academic hat on here, lots of different models of resilience, uh, lots of different um, uh, ways in which you can manage uh, resilience and, and theories of resilience. And so this particular, uh, particular one is that uh, I sort of landed on this and, and felt that it was, uh, uh, was one that sort of resonated and, and um, was quite an accessible, um, uh, accessible model. And so with vision, um, being the most important one, it's it's because if we think about it from a, an individual perspective, it's what our uh, perhaps our purpose is and what our goals are and what we're sort of aiming for. And so, if we have an understanding of what our, our, our personal um, uh, vision is, uh, what our goals and objectives are, um, we look to go back to that if things get thrown out. Um, so, if, you know, some of these external factors come at us and we get thrown one way um, actually if we've got a vision if we've got a goals and objectives we can just sort of look to bring that back into focus and say okay this is where i'm headed and this is where i sort of need to navigate back to so having that vision um, is is really important um, just as a company would have a company vision if you look at uh, company websites um, you know um, if you look at an airline's website um, quite a lot of them actually have a company vision, uh, an overarching sort of aim uh, that they're going for, um, whether it's to deliver the best customer service in, in the region that they're operating to, or um, you know to have the most developed um, uh, people working for the organisation and motivated people. Whatever the vision, uh, you know, be the biggest airline or whatever it is, that's the vision by which everything else flows from that. Uh, the company objectives, the um, goals, measures and targets that people could be measured by all go back to whatever the company's vision is. So if you have your own vision, if you have your own goals and, and, and needs and expectations and you're aware of those, if you've written those down, um, you know, that's what you should come back to if you're sort of getting thrown out a little bit with whatever's sort of happening. And, and of course, you know, it, it, it'll depend on an individual, um, how they're able to um, determine what their vision is. You could have a very small vision, um, just a sort of a short term one, or you could have a large, uh, larger term vision or objective. Um, but as long as you are aware of what it is that you're seeking, uh, seeking to do. So if I can just sort of share a, a little bit of, uh, of a story with you, I'm, I was in a situation whereby I um, I took a promotion and traveled halfway around the world uh, to take up a uh, take up a promotion and moving my family um, from that other side of the world uh, to take that up. And um, this was in 2008. And um, two weeks after I started my new role, um, we got 
called into the uh, into the boardroom and and told that um, we were about to cut the workforce by 10 percent uh, because of the global financial crisis and the drop in demand and, and the drop in uh, capacity that the airline was undertaking and and of course my first thought was Oh, well, I'm last on, I, I'm first off. Uh, so, you know, here I go. I've just um, left a very stable and secure uh, job and and uh, brought my family, uh, you know, down to this. There's no hope in going back because, you know, 10% being cut everywhere across the company. Uh, so, you know, but, you know, my, my vision was, um, actually, I, I wanted to be, um, you know, more available for my family. I need be around and so it was about reframing okay well if i do get um, made redundant or or if i um i just need to find something i'm still going to be with my family i'm just going to have to find something else to do and so actually as it turned out um there were other measures brought in and some people took um, you know days off during the week and so on that allowed me to uh, my um, my role which was excellent um but by having that vision, what was the purpose of me actually taking this role in the first place was to be more available and accessible to my family. So even if I didn't end up doing that job, if I, if I had to go and do something else, that was still what I wanted to be doing. So it may not have been the role that I wanted to do and, and the role that I um, you know, traveled halfway across the world to do, but I still had my purpose. And as long as I was still able to do that, that would be okay with me. Okay, I'd still be mourning the loss of um, not actually doing the role that I wanted to do and the fact that it happened in a short period of time, but I would still be available for my family. And that was what um, my vision and purpose behind it was. So, I, I mean, I, I hope that hasn't simplified it too much, but it just sort of, just sort of shows how I've sort of uh, applied that um, unconsciously, you know, even before I was aware of the domains of resilience, you know. Yeah, I think you wrapped it up nicely here uh, with your story. <laughs> and I really do hope that uh, someone who's watching can really reflect on that and maybe use, you know, for their own advantage. Uh, but that's our time for today. I really want to do thank you again for, for joining me. I enjoyed the conversation with you. I hope we have uh, some more soon. Um, but also, once again, I invite everyone to watch John's uh, course. And John, if you want to say anything for everyone who might, you know, consider learning more about resilience. Certainly. So as, as I've mentioned, it's, it's very much about, um, you know, the concepts of, of resilience and how within the aviation um, uh, environment, uh, you may consider them either from an individual or organizational uh, perspective. And hopefully after you've um, uh, undertaken the, uh, the course, it makes you want to actually learn more. Because uh, as, as, I, as I mentioned, you know, that's all part of the continuous improvements and, and learning never stops is something I always say. So hopefully it makes you want to actually look into um, different elements that um, the concepts that may uh, have become, been new to you um, makes you want to actually go and explore that further uh, for your individual needs. So um, that's what I'm hoping uh, you get from uh, from the course. So thanks, um, Laura, for the opportunity to, uh, to talk. And it was really great having the conversation with you. I loved every second of it as well. So <laughs> thanks a lot. Thanks to everyone who's watching. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Stay safe.